stomp or do. Tell me, tell me, tell me true. Magic mirror, tell me today, did, did all my friends have fun at play? <gasps> I see Shelly and Gus and Carl and Darren and, oh, there's Oleg and Omar and, oh, Shelly, it's good to see you. That's a little flashback to the Marty past. Imagine me sitting on the Shag Park carpet in my parents' living room, tuned in to the romper room. And if you were like me, you were just waiting to be seen by that host, for her to say your name. She never said Marty. <laughs> she never said Neville either, that's my sister's name. Curse of having creative parents, I guess, but we yearn to be seen and we were invisible. That's what I want to talk to you about today, that sense of how we can see each other, how we can open up our world by opening up our eyes and opening up our viewfinder to seeing more of who's out there. One of the first memories I have, my future that started yesterday, was at school, high school. And like you, I was bright. You're probably way brighter than I was, but I was bright enough to be really precocious and a little ADD. So my friends and I were troublemakers. We sat in the back row, and particularly in one class with the chicken lady. Uh, the chicken lady was our chemistry teacher, and we called her the chicken lady because she moved like this. <laughs> And it was really hard to pay attention in her class, but she talked out of her teeth, and she would pick at you when she would talk about formulas. And when she would do that, we just, we were so annoyed. We were only more annoyed by the flab on the math teacher's arm, but anyway, the chemistry teacher, <laughs> chicken lady, we were mean to her. You know, she was a caricature to us. She wasn't real, she was a cartoon character, what you would expect. One particular day, as she was writing a formula on the board, my friends decided this would be the appropriate time to relocate the mobile lab in the middle of our classroom. And I burst out laughing because it was pretty funny. And the chicken lady, Arr! Miss Avery, stop that now. I want you to pick up your books and go to the library. believe it. You know, I wasn't doing anything. I was just laughing at my friends. I wasn't the person who'd done anything. And as I picked up my books, I felt this prickly heat of shame rise through my body, up the back of the neck, and ignite the bulbs in my hair. And by the time I'd hit the door, I was so pissed off. I was already strategizing how I was going to take her down. I had it all figured out, you know, she was a terrible teacher, lots of kids were failing her class, she couldn't hold our interest, it wasn't our fault, it was her fault. She was a terrible teacher, she didn't know anything about chemistry, and she certainly wasn't entertaining enough for us teenagers. So I had a good half an hour to plot my defense, and I was so ready for her when she came in, I was like, come on. She came in, she was, into the library, <laughs> and she sat down, and she said, I'm so sorry for picking you out like that. <laughs> it's just, I was frustrated. I, I, I know I'm a terrible teacher, and it's really important that these kids learn chemistry, and not everyone's as smart as you, not everyone picks things up as easily. We have to worry about these other kids, and I need your help. <laughs> Not quite how I'd pictured the transaction unfolding, but Mrs. Ross, the chicken lady, taught me so much in that moment. I don't remember a lick of chemistry or most of what I took in high school, but I do remember that humility Paul talked about humility being that sense of your, your scale in the universe. 
And Mrs. Ross, chicken lady, drove that home to me. She also taught me about how you can move yourself over enough to make room for another person to exist and to open up your field of view so that you're not the most important thing in the room. She talked to my soul and she told complete truth about her own shortcomings. She had the strength to be vulnerable. And that's so key to building trust and, and to being powerful is to be able to show your soft underbelly like a beta dog in the park. You need to be able to, to be soft in order to be strong. In Sanskrit, they have a word called namaste, which you've probably heard in yoga class. At the end of the class, teacher says namaste. And namast means bow to, and te means you. So namaste really means I bow to you. And it's come to mean culturally more than that. It means the spirit in me sees the spirit in you or acknowledges the spirit in you. And that's what I want in my future. I want to be able to walk through Toronto and say hi to strangers and have them see me and have me see them and have that namaste moment. I passed a lot of you when you were in line and I said hi to probably 25, 30 of you. Nobody said hi back. Why is that? Why do we shut down to strangers? What is it about strangers? Stranger danger. <laughs> what is it about stranger danger? Yeah, you could be a freak. You know, you, you, could, you could meet me. But you could also meet the savior of your life. The future that I'm living now started three years ago on a beautiful summer night in July. I was in the Rockies kayaking with two people I didn't know very well, Linda and Kevin. In fact, I'd met Kevin in the parking lot. And we were down the slotted canyon in a fairly gently moving river, which was about to become an overwhelmingly scary river. And I was the third rubber ducky in the flow. And I saw Kevin disappear over this false horizon. And my <coughs> heart went in my throat because I wasn't prepared for that. I knew there was a class five rapid, class six being certain death for me anyway. Class five was almost certain death. And I quickly peeled out into an eddy, which is a recirculating place where I could be safe and watch what was happening. And I saw Kevin drop down, and I saw him come out the other side, and I thought, okay, there's life on the other side of that rock. And then I saw Linda go down, and I looked around at my options, and there was a cliff on one side and a fast-moving river on the other, and I had no other choice. Followed them down. That was a big mistake. <laughs> Paddling down. First chance I get the, to view where I'm heading, it's a sluice way that's so narrow I have to turn my paddle sideways so that I can ride down without losing my paddle. And I'm horrified. My eyeballs must have been like this. I was like a cartoon character. And when I hit the bottom, I could see that there was a, a cliff in front of me with all the water pillowing up on the edge. So I steeled myself to make sure that I was going to be really balanced. And I paddled aggressively to this thing and I boofed into the cliff and I popped up onto my stern and I was like, I spun around and my heart was beating like a hammer as my kayak landed. I was like, oh, I made it, I made it. I scratched, crashed into a big cliff, get thrown over, my paddle gets twisted, and I'm now upside down in water, knowing that there's another rapid that's going to shred my face if I don't get back up again. Good incentive, right? I mean, exfoliation is one thing, but that's really an extreme. <laughs> So I try and roll up, and I try and roll up, but my paddle's gotten twisted, and I can't get purchase on the water. And I try and wiggle out, and I do what you really don't want to do. I have to pull my skirt and get out of my boat. But I've got the presence of mind to hold on to my boat, hold on to my paddle. That's what they tell you to do. And as I come down the next little sluice way, I see that it's a bit calmer. Linda's over here. Kevin's over here have to make a judgment call. Do I go river left, river right? I go river right towards Kevin. And he's gesticulating wildly. And I think he's saying, go this way. 
He's actually not, he's saying watch out, but anyway, I go to where he's pointing. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to point where to go, but anyway, I'm paddling along, or uh, swimming along, trying to keep the boat from smashing into me, holding onto my paddle, and I, I, I can see shore, and I think if I can just make it down this next little section, I'll be fine, and whew, oh! I'm pinned against a log, my boat comes in behind me, fills up with water, and it's like there's an elephant pushing on my chest, and I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I see Kevin, go down the river, don't know where Linda is, and I, with my last breath, scream, ah! I don't know if he hears me or not. My brain's working fast, what do I do, what do I do? I try and move, and I, I tried so hard to move that I actually shredded the skin off my stomach and I couldn't move. And I look straight ahead and see my water bottle, blue Nalgene, traveling down the river, and I think, this is the day that I die. This is it. This is it. And I think, well, I've lived a good life. You know, I've, I've always done what was important to me. I've loved well. If I have to die, it's a beautiful night. Look at the light on the <laughs> cliff. And I think, oh, maybe I should pray. So my prayer goes something like, God, I know you're busy. There's wars and famine. And throw up my prayer. Nothing happens. And I resign myself to what's going to happen. And then there's a motion out of the corner of my eye that I see. And I look over and up on the big rock that's got the log attached to it, I see Kevin. He's somehow miraculously paddled up the river against the current, against all odds, clambered up onto this rock in record time. And he's now looking at me. And I think, oh, God, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. And he very carefully positions his body, and he, he's trying to not fall in, because that would be deadly to him. And he reaches over as far as he can without falling in, and he tries to move the bow of my boat. And it doesn't move a millimeter. And I think, he's going to feel so guilty for the rest of his life. And that really sucks. And I can't tell him that I'm okay with it. I have no air to tell him I'm okay with it. And then my martial arts training kicks in and I think, circles, dance with the enemy, move with the flow. I'm not moving with the flow. How can I move with the flow? How can I do circles here? What if I roll my body over the log and I'm trying to tell Kevin with sign language as sparkles start to appear before my eyes that I'm going to try and put my face in the water and if he could just, you know, maybe jump or something while I'm doing that, that it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, from his position on the rock, he sees me go pale blue and he sees my eyes roll into the back of my head as my face falls into the water. And that's the call to action that he needed. He jumps in, whoo, pulls my boat with all his weight, boat goes flying off, and we both float down the river, crawl onto a beach to safety. He was a hero. But what's a hero? You know, what did he actually do? Well, he was prepared to trade his life for my life. The spirit in him saw that spirit in me about to expire. And it's not that he didn't consider his own safety. I know he did, because I saw him step back. But then I saw him make the decision and step back in. And that's made all the difference to whether I have a future or not. So I really want to encourage us to 
try and step into that namaste moment more often with our colleagues and our friends and our family. And when you're sitting doing emails at night and your partner comes over and says, can we talk? That you say yes, because you're only going to have that conversation once. If you don't have it then, that conversation's going to go away. That if you see a stranger in the street, you look at them and you smile at them. You have them be seen because in my books, the biggest sin isn't murder. The biggest sin is indifference. It's an offense against humanity. It's a, an offense against creativity to not see you. When I see you, I see a bit of me. And when you're looking through your little magic mirror, romper, bomper, stomper do, you see me and I see you because you am I and I am you. Namaste.